talk to you about fat biology. And just to give you a little bit of a background on me, I am a senior here at Cornell University studying ecology and evolutionary biology. And I've know, always known I wanted to be a scientist since I was about 10 years old. But I had absolutely no idea what kind of scientist, what I wanted to study. I just knew I wanted to be outside studying animals. And so when I was in high school, I got the amazing opportunity to go to St. John's in the US Virgin Islands with my AP biology class. And it was an amazing trip, but the thing I remember the most was one particular hike that we made to the top of a, a very large hill where there were some old sugar mill ruins. The coolest part was when you looked up at the ceiling, there were all of these bats. And I just remember standing there, looking up at all these bats, and just thinking, wow, they are really cool. And since then, I've been hooked. And so what I want to do today is talk to you about why bats are so amazing and why you should want to learn more about them. So first question I would ask when talking about something like bats is, what is a bat? They're pretty unique creatures. Um, they are in fact mammals, which many people don't always realize. Uh, they have fur, they give birth to live young, and they also nurse that young the same way cows and humans do. They are the world's only true flying mammal, which means that they are able to fly on their own accord without using wind or just air, the same way the way some flying squirrels and such do. They can live for a really long time. Bats uh, this size, so pretty tiny, can live to be 15 to 20 year old, years old in the wild. And in captivity, they've been known to live even longer, up to 35 years. And even though they kind of look like flying mice, with these small furry bodies and little round ears, bats are in fact more closely related to primates, like chimpanzees, lemurs, and humans, than they are to mice or any other mammals. So, one thing that's really characteristic about bats are their wing morphology. Their scientific name, they belong to the order Chiroptera, which all bats belong to, and that name literally translates to hand wing. And if you were to look at the bones of a human, a bird, and a bat, they're all fairly analogous. They all have the same basic structure. And bats, in fact, do have a very typical wing-like, hand-like structure in their wings. The only difference between our hands and their wings is that they have slightly elongated fingers and they have a wing, a skin membrane that extends between the fingers and allows them to fly. They have thumb-like claws, just like human hands, that they use to crawl, climb, and groom. And they also have a very sporadic and swooping flight. Unlike birds, they kind of push the air forward when they're flying instead of flapping up and down. Bird wings are better designed for flight, but bats' hand wings allow them greater maneuverability when hunting things like insects. And so just to give you another idea, this is a bat skeleton of a little brown bat. And you can see it has the thumb and then these very long, thin fingers that extend down and make up the portion of the wing. Bats also have a unique body morphology. They, their knees are turned around 180 degrees, so the opposite of how human knees bend. And that's what partly allows them to hang upside down. Something else bats do that pretty much no other mammal does. They have specialized tendons in their feet that allow them to clasp on without using energy. So that when they're hanging upside down, they're not exerting energy and holding on to that grip. Instead, these tendons kind of lock in place and when the bat is ready to let go and begin flying, it uses a little bit of energy to release those tendons and begin flight. And one question that everyone always wonders about bats is, why do they hang upside down? Uh, their wings, as I've said, are poorly designed for flight, and so hanging upside down allows them to already have a large amount of air underneath them to let them get enough lift to stay off the ground. It's also great because these are very small animals and so would make a very tasty snack for many different animals like foxes or raccoons. And so hanging upside down allows them to stay out of the reach of many of these predators. And so now we've talked a little bit about what bats look like. Now let's talk about where bats are found. 
Bats are in fact found on every continent except for Antarctica. And bats fall into two major classifications. The megachiroptera, or the megabats, which are the flying foxes, such that if you're familiar with the book Stella Luna, she was a flying fox. They're found only in tropical areas, and they're also only found in old world distribution. So they're only found in places like Africa, Europe, and Asia, and Australia. They have very, very large wingspans in general, and they also have much large, larger bodies than normally associated with bats. They have these fox-like faces with a long nose, small ears, and very large eyes, and they mostly feed on fruit and nectar. And these bats can be, as I've said, very large. The largest bat known is the golden crowned flying fox, which has a wingspan that can reach up to six and a half feet. So, like the height of a basketball player. And so now we have, in addition to the mega bats, what might be more familiar to you are the micro bats, these are microcoptera. And they are found everywhere that bats are found. So not only in Africa and Australia and Asia, but they're also found in both South and North America. And these are the type of bats that you would most commonly see in your backyard here in New York. They are characterized by having smaller bodies and wingspans. They also have very diverse face shapes. So they have kind of different shorter noses, very distinct large ears in many species, and very small eyes. They hunt a whole range of things from fruit to nectar to insects to even frogs and other vertebrates, even other bats. And so I'm going to focus mostly on these guys today because these are the kind that you find here in New York. Bats have, a f just to give you a brief idea, there's a few different behaviors that bats display in general, um, particularly these microcoptera. All bats are nocturnal, which means that they hunt and breed at night and sleep during the day. Many bats, especially in the New York area, live in colonies, which are these large groups that they all associate together. And they often all emerge at once at dusk to go feed, and they can be seen all returning back to their uh, caves or sleeping location in, at dawn. They sleep upside down, as we've mentioned, and these colonies can be huge. There are several colonies uh, in Texas of uh, Mexican free-tailed bats, which are also these micro bats, and they can reach up to millions of bats in one colony. However, not all bats live in colonies. Uh, many bats are also solitary, so they sleep by themselves and they sleep in places uh, among foliage and trees, under bark, and even in places like old woodpecker holes. So bats that live in places like North America needs somewhere or something to do when it starts to get really cold, since their uh, main prey source, insects, is no longer available in the winter, they have to have an alternative strategy. So bats do one of two things. They either hibernate, and these, this occurs in places called hibernaculums, where a large number of bats will all sleep together for the winter, or bats can migrate. And the bats of this area tend to migrate towards uh, Mexico, Texas, uh, the Gulf Coast, and Florida. So where it's warmer and where they can remain active throughout the winter before returning back to New York to breed. And so in the spring, they come back and they form what are called nursery colonies. And this is basically a large group of all females who come together to give birth to their young and take care of the young throughout the spring. And these nursery colonies can be very crowded with hundreds, thousands of babies all in one place. And bats are very unique in that they are able to come back and find their own young. And they will in fact only feed their own young and not anyone else's, which is pretty impressive when you consider how hard it would be to find a single bat in a large crowd. And so we mentioned it's now summer and the bats are, are fully active. They've had their young, the young are now flying. So what are they primarily doing? Well, what they're doing when they go out at night is mostly hunting. Over 70% of all bat species are insectivores, meaning they eat insects. And in fact, all bat species that are found in New York are insect eaters. And they can eat a lot of insects. A bat about this size, so maybe a, a little brown bat or even a little bit bigger, a big brown bat, 
can eat approximately 700 insects in one hour. It's a lot of insects. They hunt from the air, since that's their, their prey is also aerial, which can be really difficult if you're out hunting at night, and it's dark, and it's really hard to see. Even though bats are not blind, despite what you might think, they actually have very excellent vision, about the same as a human, except bats that are nocturnal and hunt insects only can see in black and white, so they can't see color the same way that humans do. But so, instead of relying on sight to find their food, they rely on something else. They rely on sound. And this process is called echolocation. And it's in which the bat emits high pitch, often ultrasonic, or a higher frequency than humans can hear with our naked ear. And these sounds uh, go out into space and they bounce off objects and come back to the bat. And the bat can measure the frequency of these sounds and know how far away an object is, if it's moving, and what direction the object is moving in. And that's what enables them to find and locate and hunt down these flying insects. And these giant bat ears that we have mentioned are especially important in this process of echolocation. These large ears help to focus the echo into the bat's brain, which allows it to very quickly uh, determine where the insect is as it's hunting. And so, why use echolocation? Why not just use sight or something else? As I mentioned, it can be very difficult to see in low light conditions, and insects are very, very quickly fast moving. So it can be very hard for, even if you could see in full daylight, to hunt down something that's moving so quickly and is so small. And so this sound is basically immune to those kind of problems. It's also important to note, like bird song, that uh, sounds are also very unique to the species. So each species has its own distinct sound. And like birdsong, they also use their uh, bat uh, ultrasonic noises to not only find food, but also to communicate with each other and in courtship, the same way a bird sings to attract mates. Bats are a highly diverse group of mammals. Uh, they, in fact, make up over one quarter of all mammal species in the world, with over 1,200 species and more still being classified and discovered today. And about 50 bat species are found in the U.S. and North America. You might be wondering, what makes bats so important to us? Uh, bats, in fact, provide a large number of important ecological services, such as uh, pollinating and seed distribution for many crops that we, we like to eat, such as bananas and uh, mangoes, many of these are distributed by our tropical megabats. In addition, bats, especially in this area, can play a large role in pest management. They especially like to eat uh, insects such as corn borrows and mosquitoes, all of which are very detrimental to human uh, food supply and human health. Unfortunately, though, about half of U.S. species are endangered or are declining. If they're not quite endangered yet, their, their population is rapidly decreasing. And this is due to things such as habitat loss, loss of uh, hibernate, hibernation locations and nursery colonies, and also due to disease. Which brings me to another very important thing I wanted to talk about that's very relevant to bat populations here in New York State, and that is the white nose syndrome. White-nose syndrome was first discovered in Albany in 2006, so not very far from, from Ithaca. And it has since spread as far north as Ontario and as far south as Tennessee. So it's rapidly moving across the country and infecting more and more bats each year. It's named for a white fungus that grows on the, the wings, the nose, and the ears of the bats during hibernation. And what seems to happen is that whatever the, the fungus seems to be changing the behavior of the bats so that during hibernation they become restless and they either move around and lose their fat reserves or they leave their, their hibernation location too soon and so uh, become victims to the uh, inclement weather that we often have. This is, has a devastating death rate of approximately 70% of bats who become infected with white nose syndrome will not make it through the winter. And it's uh, transmitted by bat-to-bat -bat contact only. So in these large colonies, it's very easy for bats to uh, infect one another. 
And it also was mainly affecting uh, the very large um, bats that nest in colonies, so our little browns, the big browns, and also the endangered Indiana bat. So it might seem kind of hopeless. I mean, what could we possibly do to help? Um, scientists are working on trying to figure out how to classify the fungus and the best ways to treat it, and also more about how it's spread and what ways could be used to stop the spread. But there is something you can do. So I brought in, this is a bat box that I made with my father about 10 years ago. Um, it's, it's kind of like a bird box, but for bats. And what pe people are being encouraged to do is to put up bat boxes in their yard and provide basically smaller alternative locations for bats to roost during the winter, during the summer, where they can prevent the spread of white nose syndrome by basically creating smaller populations, which makes the bats themselves less vulnerable to widespread extinction. And so this it's a pretty simple design. It's basically just a small box. On the inside, uh, it's very hard to see, but my dad and I put bark lining the, the inside to let bats uh, hang on when they decide to roost in here. Bats can take up to three years to decide if they want to roost in one of these things. So if you decide to, to build one and put one up and it's not occupied within a few months, don't worry. Sometimes it just takes a while for them to learn that it's there and eventually it will be occupied. And then also other things you can do are uh, bat counts, many local caves and even local buildings where people know that there's a bat colony. You can go and sit outside and watch the bats as they emerge for the night, often during the summer. And that gives scientists an idea of what the population is of bats in that particular area. And this happens all over the Northeast. And thanks for watching. Thank you.